I'm Judith Fagan from Sarasota with my 102-year-old mother, Dr. Helen Fagan, a Holocaust survivor and educator, and my inspiration. Greetings, everyone. It's Becky and David Heller joining from Cleveland. Helen, we're so glad that you're with us here today. Hi, this is Adam Friedland from New York. I'm proud to represent my city and the next generation of museum supporters. My name is Karen Lansky Edlin. I'm a daughter of two Holocaust survivors, and I'm proud to be representing Atlanta. Hi, it's Shelley Himmelrich, daughter of a Holocaust survivor, here with my husband, Billy, from Boca Raton, Florida. Hi, it's Jamie Diamond Schwartz. And David Schwartz from Chicago. Chicagoans are so proud to support the museum. Dee Dee Simon, and I am thrilled to be joining from St. Louis. Hi, this is Amy Cohn from Phoenix. The museum is such an important part of our community. Greetings from Los Angeles. I'm Deborah Oppenheimer, and I'm so proud to represent the many museum supporters here in LA. Hi, I'm Susan Lowenberg from San Francisco. My late father, Bill Lowenberg, was a survivor and one of the founders of the museum. And it's so incredible to be standing in solidarity with all of you across the country for the mission of the museum. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. I am Howard Lorber, the chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. All of us are dealing with the challenges and uncertainties of this unprecedented crisis. The health and safety of our loved ones, friends, and colleagues are at the forefront of our thoughts. But the crisis is also challenging each of us to reflect on what is really important in life. And that brings me to the museum and tonight's program. The museum doors might be temporarily closed, but virtually our doors are wide open. Holocaust education can never stop. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for a very special Facebook Live. My name is Edna Friedberg, and I'm a historian at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. We are coming to you today and in the coming weeks live from our homes. How did life change immediately for people in Warsaw? Well, the Germans described this invasion of Poland as a blitzkrieg or lightning war. Uh, you're seeing here the destruction in one neighborhood of Warsaw. Welcome to the digital discussion, Medicine and Contagion in Nazi Germany. Welcome everyone to the digital discussion on Nazi Germany and perceptions of permanent crisis. Hi, I'm Becky. I'm a teacher in Northern New York and I'm making a postcard from the field for the museum to express my gratitude. Just a huge thank you for all of the resources for myself and for the teachers across Tennessee. My name is Julie Zucker. I'm from the Holocaust Memorial Museum of San Antonio. We really use your resources. We just want you to know. This is Todd Hennessy with the Colorado Holocaust Educators in Denver, Colorado. The Holocaust Encyclopedia is our number one recommended page. Hi, this is Emily Bernstein, Education Outreach Associate from the Holocaust Center of Pittsburgh and Czech participant. We're focusing on your items that teachers can easily translate to Google Classroom, Google Forms, focusing on your online exhibits so that students have something vivid to look at and process with their teachers. I don't know what I would do during this time without you. Thank you so much for these opportunities and for this tremendous support that you have offered during this pandemic. We are so fortunate to have supporters like all of you and fortunate to have dedicated chairs who were planning to host this event in person. While the event has changed, their commitment has not wavered. On behalf of the museum, I want to thank Laura and Jonathan Gins and Julie Farkas and Seth Goldman and their committee for their exceptional leadership at this challenging time. If we were together, this is where I would lead the applause. Thank you, Howard. I know I speak for John, Julie, and Seth in saying it's an honor to chair this event and be part of the museum's family. We volunteered to do so in very different times, and yet we realize that coming together is in some ways even more meaningful given the times we live in. My father was a Holocaust survivor, and keeping his story and his memory alive for future generations is what draws us to appreciate the museum's mission. And it really is amazing to be virtually joined by so many supporters from communities across the country. Now I'd like to turn it over to Seth. Thanks, Laura and John. This morning, many of us participated in the museum's first virtual national remembrance ceremony. 
It was a moving reminder that the survivors are our most powerful teachers. And as we connect with each other in the midst of this crisis, I'm reminded of the short time frame we have to keep their living memory alive. I was struck by the fact that the first COVID fatality in Israel was an 88-year-old Holocaust survivor named Arya Evan. The work at the museum is to ensure a living legacy that goes beyond the lifespan of our survivors and even ourselves. Julie lost more than 40 family members, Transylvanian Jews who were among the last transports to Auschwitz, and that history has had a profound impact on our family and our view of the world. Every day, the museum teaches that the lessons of the Holocaust are relevant at all times to all people. It is reaching millions with information and insights about the fragility of freedom and the dangers of hate and indifference. Those were the lessons of Elie Wiesel, the museum's visionary founder for whom the museum's highest honor is named. His words are emblazoned on the award, words he lived by. One person of integrity can make a difference. And that's certainly true for the 2020 Elie Wiesel Award recipient, Maziar Bahari, an Iranian-Canadian journalist who has demonstrated exceptional courage in bringing the truth of the Holocaust to Iran and throughout the Middle East. You may know of Maziar through John Stewart's film, Rosewater, based on Maziar's experience as a prisoner in Iran's infamous Evan prison. Let's take a look. John Stewart joins us live now from the Daily Show studio in New York. John, did you make this film out of a sense of collective guilt or was it something specific about Maziar's character? I think it was more something about Maziar's character. Maziar's memoir was so incredibly well done and, and so moving in that, in how he reclaimed his humanity during that time of captivity. Uh, and he and I became very good friends. So it, it stemmed from that. It was compelling in the generational aspects of it, in his family, the fact that his father had suffered a similar fate under the Shah. His sister had suffered it under Khomeini. He had suffered under Khamenei. It's our pleasure to welcome museum director Sarah Bloomfield and Maziar Bahari. Hello, Maziar. It's great to be with you and hear that you and your family are safe at home in London. You know, I'm following how the Iranians are handling the COVID-19 crisis, and even there, of course, also blaming the Americans and the Jews. Um, they're even making cartoons to express this very point. They are blaming the Jews for the current crisis, and they're not, they're not saying anything original. Some of the texts that they are quoting, it is exactly the translation of things that have been said by Russian anti-Semites and German anti-Semites, the British anti-Semites. So they're following a very familiar path using the same stereotypes and conspiracy theories that have been prevalent in Europe for centuries. And that's why your partnership with our Levine Institute is so important. Um, let's start by talking about your remarkable life. You were born uh, in Iran under the Shah, and then, of course, the revolution changed your life. And the reason we're here tonight is that you're receiving the museum's highest honor, our Elie Wiesel Award. And this is because you've devoted your life to such an unlikely pursuit, Holocaust education, and something even more unlikely, is that your target audience is the Iranian people. So let's go back and tell that story, starting with the revolution. So uh, I was 11 and a few months when the revolution happened in Iran and I've come from a political family and my family, like millions of other Iranians, supported the revolution and they believed in Khomeini as the leader of the revolution and my family, like the rest of the revolutionaries, most of the revolutionaries in Iran, they deluded themselves by thinking that Khomeini would lead the revolution, then they would, he would just step aside and let more democratic forces to take over the government. Of course, they were wrong. So tell us about anti-Semitism under this regime. Khomeini, of course, was always anti-Israeli. He uh, started his movement in 1963, and he started uh, his anti-Israeli rhetoric in 1962, 63 as well. Many uh, Iranian Jews, I can say thousands of Iranian Jews, they uh, left Iran within a few months after the revolution. But then, 
A few months after the revolution, something happened that really scared not only the Iranian Jewish community, but Jews around the world. And that was the killing of Abi Belhanya, who was the uh, leader of the Jewish community in Iran. And through that killing, that, through that execu execution, the Iranian government wanted to send a message to the rest of the Jews in Iran that we are in charge now. And because of that, more than half of the Iranian Jews, more than half of the 90,000 Iranian Jews who were living in Iran until uh, 1979, left Iran within a decade. And thousands of Jews, they left Iran after that. And at the moment, we do not have exact number of how many Jews live in Iran. They are living a very insecure life. They can be attacked. Uh, they can be arrested, uh, charged with spying for Israel. Uh, certain rights can be given to them on one day and can be taken away from them uh, the next day. So the revolution clearly had a disastrous impact on the Jewish community. And you yourself left and went to Canada to study at university. Tell us about how that experience changed your own understanding of anti-Semitism. Sure. Uh, so in Canada, there is a very strong, very vibrant uh, Jewish community. And I was interested in the writings of Mordecai Richler and I was living a few blocks where Leonard Cohen uh, grew up. So uh, for me, uh, it was a revelation to live in this amazing city with such a strong uh, uh, history of Jewish culture and Jewish traditions. But then I heard certain people uh, at university, at uh, different places of work that I was working as a student, expressing anti-Semitic sentiments. And these were the sentiments that I never heard in Iran. They were very specific. In Iran, they were, were always talking about Israel being uh, evil. And in Canada, I heard more specific uh, anti-Semitic uh, sentiments. For example, they were talking about the role of Jews in uh, the Second World War, the, the era, sorry, the era before the Second World War when the Jews were somehow responsible for the economic uh, problems in Quebec especially. And then the, the more I heard about uh, these sentiments, the more I, uh, curious I, become, uh, I became, and I wanted to know more. So tell us about that. A lot of the strengths of the Jewish culture, Jewish community in Canada and in Montreal specifically was because of, discrimin was, was because of the discrimination against the Jews. For example, there's a Jewish hospital in Montreal right now, which is a very good hospital, very advanced hospital, but it was established because Jews could not go to many other hospitals. McGill University, which is the best English, uh, one of the best English uh, speaking universities in the world, and I took some courses at McGill, had quotas for uh, Jewish students. And in that uh, class, of course, I heard more about anti-Semitism. And of course, I had heard about the quotas for uh, Jewish refugees and Jewish immigrants during the Second World War, during the Holocaust uh, in Canada as well. So I, was, I read different books and articles, and I came across the story of the St. Louis, the ship of Jewish immigrants with more than 900 passengers that left uh, Hamburg in Germany in May 1939. Most of the passengers on the ship, they had temporary visas to Cuba, and they were supposed to settle there in order to migrate to the U.S. mostly, and all, uh, some of them were supposed to go to Canada. When the ship of Jewish immigrants got to Cuba, their visas were annulled, and they all had to go back to Europe, and unfortunately, many of them uh, died during the Holocaust. So I found some survivors of the St. Louis. We brought them together from different parts of the world. And that was my first film that I made in 1994. 
So that set you off on your career as a filmmaker. And at the same time, you became a journalist. And a few years later, you even went back to Iran as a journalist. That was an incredibly brave thing to do. I thought it was a good uh, moment to go back to Iran to visit my family. And I started to write for Newsweek and I started to make films for the BBC and Channel 4 in the UK. And I stayed in Iran. And I was interrogated almost on a monthly basis, but those were really cordial uh, interrogations, as cordial as interrogations can be. I can only begin to imagine what those interrogations were like. That, that was going on until 2009, uh, June 2009, when Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, the former president of Iran, was re-elected. And the election was rigged. And I witnessed the uh, rigging of that election and I wrote about it. And I also filmed the gathering, a peaceful gathering of millions of Iranians against Ahmadinejad's re-election. And by that time, I had gained some international uh, fame and people in the documentary world knew me, the journalists knew me. And the Iranian government thought that they could arrest me in order to send a message to the rest of journalists and filmmakers in Iran, and they put me through a lot of uh, pressure. Uh, during 118 days in prison, 107 days in solitary confinement, I was subjected to brutal uh, psychological and physical torture. And I'm here only because of an amazing campaign that my colleagues at Newsweek, at Washington Post Company, my family, my fiance at that time, my wife now, uh, they uh, staged for me and I was released. The last day before I left Iran, my interrogator met me in a cafe in Iran and he told me that if you ever talk about what happened to you in prison, we will all, we can always bring you back in a bag. So just shut up and go see your family and, you know, be quiet about this. But as soon as I came out, uh, I wrote a 10,000 word article for Newsweek about my experience. I wrote a book and the book became a film by John Stewart, which was released in 2014 called Rosewater. And I've been trying to be a voice for the people who are voiceless in Iran. And Many people, uh, many of my colleagues in Iran, they are not as fortunate as I was when I was in prison. And I thought, you know, it's my responsibility. I never wanted to be an activist, but I became, I've become an accidental activist. And I think it's a responsibility that I have to speak out on their behalf. Maziar, it's really, it's truly an extraordinary story. Um, I've seen the film. Your experience was just horrific. And I remember you sharing with me that while you were in solitary confinement, they were accusing you of, you know, being a Zionist and working for the Mossad. And it seems that just, you know, Jews in Israel are always this constant scapegoat. From the beginning of the revolution, we've heard anti-Israeli slogans in Iran. But of course, anti-Semitism in many countries these days uh, has turned into anti-Zionism. And in many cases, anti-Zionism is a new word for anti-Semitism. So this anti-Zionism that started in 1979 in Iran has become anti-Semitism anti in a very Western anti-Semitic format. And they've been translating many works of uh, anti-Semites in the West. They are, you know, the books of David Irving, the books of uh, Roger Garodi, and, you know, all the classic anti-Semitic texts, uh, they've, uh, they've been translated into Persian. And by now, anti-Semitism is uh, a very strong, uh, I think, ideology among a certain group of people who support the Iranian government. So that combined with a very corrupt, inefficient regime that has ruled Iran for the past 41 years, 
it has created this conspiracy theory. It's the veneer that uh, the Iranian government is not responsible for many of its mismanagement of the country, mismanagement of the economy, mismanagement of foreign policy, but it's the Jews who are uh, creating, sabotaging Iranian diplomatic efforts to have better relationship with the rest of the world. So why do you think it's so important for the Iranian people to understand the history and lessons of the Holocaust? I think one of the reasons that the Iranian revolution had such tragic consequences was the bigotry, the extremism, the racism, the sheer uh, ignorance at uh, certain points of the leaders of the Iranian revolution. I think the Holocaust is the most tragic, is the most horrendous event in history. Not only because of the number of people who were murdered by the Nazis and the collaborators, but also because of the way that it happened. The way that the Nazis managed to brainwash the Germans. The way that the Germans, they allowed anti-Semitism to grow in their country, the way that the collaborators around Europe, they worked with Nazis to kill millions of Jews. And I think through understanding the Holocaust, through listening to the testimonies of Holocaust survivors, through studying the Holocaust, and we are really lucky in a way that the Holocaust is the best documented uh, tra uh, tragedy uh, in history. And we can learn so much about every aspect of the Holocaust. And unfortunately, this literature is not available to many Iranians. There are certain books that have been translated into Persian, uh, but not enough. And because of that, I thought it would be great if we could have a collaboration with the Holocaust Museum to educate our audiences in Iran and beyond about what happened during the Holocaust in the West, uh, in Europe, but also to talk about the positive examples of Iranian history and the way that many Iranians, thousands of Iranians, helped uh, Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. And many people in Iran, unfortunately, do not know about it because many young Iranians, the first time they heard about the Holocaust was when uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad uh, cast doubt about the Holocaust in 2005 because he just wanted to criticize Israel. And the Iranian supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, he basically denies the Holocaust on an annual basis. He's been doing that since he's become the supreme leader uh, in 1989. And there is a great uh, eagerness amongst young Iranians to know more about the world and to know more about aspects of the world that's been denied, that's been concealed uh, from them by the Iran, by the Islamic regime. And it's a great collaboration that we have with the Holocaust Museum. In the first step, we're going to have uh, 10 articles and 10 videos about different aspects of the Holocaust. One of the articles is by Dr. Helmi, an uh, Egyptian Muslim physician who, who lived in Berlin during the Second World War and helped many Jews during his time there. We're talking about the way that the Balkan Muslims, they uh, helped Jews during the Holocaust and many other wonderful uh, articles and videos that we're going to produce and you will see in the next uh, seven, eight months or so. Maziar, it's just wonderful that you share our commitment to teaching the history and the lessons of the Holocaust. Uh, these are lessons about the fragility of freedom, the nature of hate, and the consequences of indifference. And we at the museum never could have dreamt that we could bring these lessons to the Iranian people. And it's only through our partnership with you that we can. 
So I want to congratulate you again on receiving the Ella Wiesel Award and for your truly singular contributions to advancing Holocaust education, confronting anti-Semitism, and promoting human freedom and dignity. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to receive the award. I think we are doing it for the young Iranians. They deserve much more. And I thank the museum for helping us to do that. Well, on behalf of all of us at the museum, we extend our profound gratitude to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alan Holt, Vice Chairman of the Holocaust Memorial Museum. More than anyone else, the existence and success of this museum are because of the survivors. Nothing would have been possible without them. Here they are with their messages for the future. All the Jews were deported. He was sent away to a slave camp. I went into hiding. Not knowing from one minute to another if we're going to live another day. We left with absolutely nothing. We were so uh, hounded, hounded and hounded. The tremendous pain caused by the Holocaust. 32 of my family members who were killed and murdered by the Nazis. To my two sisters and my father. Most of them starved to death and or gassed to death. My message to the future is know what the world was like and that it can happen again. Don't take your freedom, your liberty for granted. God did. Never become collaborators or bystanders or onlookers again. You can stand up to tyranny. And the terrible consequences of hate. Be more tolerant to other people. Confront hate when we see hate. You should not stand by and say, I can't do anything about it, because you can. Know that it is possible for people to stand up and do the right thing, even when they are surrounded by evil. We have promised the survivors we will always remember, but they ask more of us. So we pledge tonight that we will take their stories to the world, that we will reach young people and leaders wherever we can and inspire them to embrace these lessons. Let's end this program like we always do, in a moment of shared commitment. Light your cell phone as if it were a candle, lift it high as a symbol of your pledge to survivors, but also to the new generations that will shape the future of humanity. Together, let's say we will never forget. We will never Let's say it again. We will never forget. Thank you for joining us today. Please stay healthy and safe.